Hi, this is Prios and I'm a professional gambler. Today we will talk about the 10 most important concepts for poker players. As I'm lazy, I didn't make this up on myself. I will watch through a video from someone else called the GTO Wizard. I think I never watched a video from him before, but YouTube recommended this to me. So maybe this is good. Uh, I don't know yet. Didn't watch it. And yeah. But I definitely feel competent to comment on this, as I was, yeah, I think under the most uh, successful poker players online a few, a few years back. And yeah, let's see if these concepts make sense or not. So let's right dive into the video. Hello, Wizards. Today, I'm going to present the 10 most important concepts for new poker players. In this video, I've outlined 10 of the most important concepts for newer poker players. This video is designed to help you overcome common leaks, improve the way you study, and change your mindset for the better so that you can achieve long-term success as a poker player. Let's dive right in. Let me start with the most controversial suggestion I could think of. Learn the mechanics of game theory. Start by learning the absolute fundamentals. See, the problem with poker is that the feedback loop is very broken. You'll often be rewarded for terrible plays and punished for great plays. And that's because the edges are quite small and there's a lot of variance involved. So trying to learn through direct experience will only take you so far and is more often than not just a recipe for setting money on fire. So if you want to progress as a poker player, you need to start to understand these concepts in game theory. Such yeah, he is correct. Um... Just um, being result orientated and could make you a very bad poker player. I mean, if you get in with an open end and straight draw against a good mate hand, against which you only have like eight outs, and you win three times in a row, and then you come to the conclusion that you should always go all in with an open ender against a hand that has you beaten hard, then you learn the wrong thing. So, yeah. Theory is very important and get your conclusions from, from theory and not from your experience because this can be flawed. Such as indifference, exploitability, expected value, pot odds, minimum defense frequencies, and so on. That you do not need to be calculating all of these concepts at the table, but you do need a sense for how these actually work. For example, if your opponent bets bigger, you do... Yeah, I think um, that is very true and especially in... Today's environment where, where everyone is very solid and yeah, you have to be very good and solid fundamentally in order to be a winning poker player. Don't need to defend is why. Or if the stack to pot ratio is small, that means if there's not a lot of money behind relative to the pot, you need to be prepared to stack off wider. Indifference just means a hand is close to the line. It is very close to one decision or the other. And it's important to separate points of indifference from, for example, a clear snap fold or a clear snap call. It's called learning thresholds. And so rather than trying to calculate all of this stuff, what you're trying to do is learn what these concepts mean and how to apply them to your game in a broad abstract sense. One of the fastest ways to become a reasonably solid poker player is by studying thresholds. A threshold is a line of indifference. That is to say, what is, for example, the strongest hand I fold or the weakest hand I continue. That'd be your continuation threshold. Or you can ask maybe if you're making a bet, what is the weakest hand I can bet for a value? That is to say, when I bet this hand and get called, I'm still ahead. That's a value bet. Understanding yeah, I think that is actually very true. If you know the threshold, for example, I can stack off with this end and everything worse than that I have to fold. And you also can deduct what you can stack, stack off and what you have to fold. So yeah, this, uh, this should work out quite well. And yeah, even if you don't know the exact threshold, if you study situations like this a lot, you will get better and have a good understanding if you are in a similar spot, what hands to continue with and what hands to fold. Yeah, he's definitely right. 
where these thresholds are on different boards, different textures against different you know positions in different spots is fundamental to becoming a good poker player. Beginners always massively misevaluate these thresholds, commonly by overvaluing what amount to medium strength hands that feel to them like big hands. So the next time you review a GTO solution, go out of your way to ask these simple questions and find the very basic yeah, it's also very important to yeah, have some general principles in mind. For example, in No Limit Hold'em, in general, you want, at least this was like a thing I always got in my mind. So if I have top pair, I have a relative strong hand, I can put in a lot of money for PLO. This has to be top two pair at least. And yeah, if you have... This things in mind, it's coming more easy to to find good laydowns and stuff. So and yeah, same is true for like try to figure out how many outs you have on the flop. And let's say for no limit hold them, if you have ten or more outs, you can stack off and consider semi bluffing with your hand. And if it's less, you probably shouldn't. Yeah, something like that. I mean, I don't know if ten is correct. It obviously also depends on stack depth and uh, pot to stack ratio, but yeah, you, you get the general idea. ...of your continuation threshold or your value raise threshold or your value bet threshold. This is the quickest, easiest way to become a solid player without having to memorize everything. Okay, here's an example of how you can use GTO. I think um, if you have to use, let's say it's pattern recognition. You cannot imagine, uh, remember all the things, but find patterns that make it easier to remember. I mean, in No Limit Hold'em, the number of combinations is limited and it is more easy to remember a lot of stuff. But in PLO, this number increases exponentially and it's very hard to uh, remember all what to do with certain hands and stuff. So yeah, you have to pick up patterns in order to become a good player. And yeah, of another example for this is uh, you see um, hearts are red and some are green. So this, I guess the red part means that you have to play it aggressively with bets and raises. And yeah, and uh, green is check. And it's very hard to remember the exact frequencies, but you have to have a general idea what sort of hands um, use which frequencies or... If it's only a very small percentage which is played non-aggressive, you can just make your strategy more easy. Instead of 10% check, you could just bet with uh, all your hands. And this is not even losing that much EV in most cases. Wizard defined thresholds. Let's say you're playing the big blind facing the button on Queen Jack 6. This is a single race pot using a 50 NL rake structure. Let's say the button bets 75%. We can see that there's a whole lot going on and trying to memorize everything is really hard. So don't do that. Firstly, I recommend you change your view from vertical to horizontal. That's because this is a flush draw board and it's gonna be easier to identify flush draws in your range. Secondly, utilize this filters tab. Now I want you to ask yourself a question. What is the strongest hand we fold? Answer that question for made hands and draws. That's a very good advice. Um... This also works very well for PLO. Um, do analysis based on hand categories and don't uh, do it un in an unstructured way. So this is a very good advice. And yeah, for example, um, PLO Trainer is a very good tool where you could do this with. Um, yeah, you have links in my Twitch About page or on in my description here. I also have some other programs in there which I recommend if you want to be a successful poker player. So yeah, consider to look into it. And yeah, I think the absolute basics for everyone is to have hold a manager, at least if you play on a side where it's allowed. So don't using this program is leaving so much money on the table. And yeah, nowadays you also have to have a solver and train with it. Especially pre-flop can be trained very easily. Post-flops, even more work. And yeah, 
not that many sims available yet but yeah I, all, the, learning this too is also really important so yeah the two things you definitely need a solver and holder manager so moving on well facing a 75 percent pot size bet the strongest hand you fold is about jack eight jack nine without a backdoor flush draw similarly about 6x with no backdoor flush draw and hands like nines eight sevens and twos through fives are all folding these hands have fewer outs than your 6x despite you know eight eight technically looking stronger than a six similarly you can ask about your draws well you're never going to be folding an open ender or a flush draw or a combo draw but you might fold a gut shot right know where that continuation line is that's what's important that's going to sculpt your strategy yeah good advice and remember it changes the yeah it changes a lot um depending on the bet size with 33 percent, you obviously can defend way wider because you're getting a very good price to see the next card depending on the size of their bet if they bet 33 percent, you're going to be continuing much wider right now you're going to be mostly calling your sevens through nines but you start folding your twos through fives without a heart find where that cutoff point is find your continuation line you know now you're calling all of your gut shots except for the very worst ones i think he might also make a mistake um many players do nowadays it's so easy nowadays to to train and learn from solvers but keep in mind not all people study with solvers using these um, frequencies and this ranges against regulars and good players is fine probably even optimal but using this range against a very bad player who is doing some completely random shit is not good there you should be more exploitative and do yeah you you have to adjust your ranges based on the player type this analysis assumes that you play against someone with perfect ranges and someone who knows what gto is and has learned it and if you play against someone who is basically a monkey who's randomly clicking buttons this strategy is not the optimal one so yeah a lot of money comes from playing very good against the fish because you don't make the money from other regulars normally you make your money from the spot of the table and the weak player and against him it's not always optimal to play gto there you should use an exploitative exp um, approach yeah similarly you can try and find value thresholds for example let's say you're playing the button here and you want to know how you should proceed on the turn on this brick turn i think we got the point hmm. okay let's see what he has to say well, we see a whole bunch of different sizes here you're a little confused use this drop down group them together and now we see it mainly just over bets or checks how's the it also um this strategy is very hard i mean he has like one two three four bet sizes and one two race sizes i mean in, in plo you never have that many bet sizes and race sizes this is just because the game tree is so much bigger and so many calculations are needed on top of the calculations already in so that you don't that the computer is not existing at least at least you cannot afford it to make this calculation so that's why you have to limit yourself to one at least or maybe two bad sizes if you have a very good computer and yeah this is pure luxury if you see this from a plo player player standpoint where you can have so many bad sizes and race sizes if you transist from hold'em to uh, plo you will be wondering how people can play so well <laughs> because the simulations are yeah way small not none of these simulations are not smaller but the options you got are way more limited because yeah otherwise you would run out of memory when you're trying to build these trees overbet constructed hover over this icon and you can see it's mostly going to be top pair plus for value and mixing in 
you know, some draws, some ace high, flush draws, combo draws. And in fact, you can press this button that isolates the betting range and you can use the filters here. Well, we know that about top pair plus is what's going to be value betting, right? You can't be doing this with second pair. You can't over bet with a jack because you're just overplaying your hand. You know that most draws can be put in here at some frequency and reasonable hands like second pair or weak queen X are not strong enough to overbet. These hands should check back and play a medium strength range. So find your value thresholds, find your continuation thresholds, figure out what hand class is appropriate for what action, use the filters, use the grouping, and try and find the overall shape of the range rather than trying to meticulously memorize each and every frequency. This leads me to point number three. It's not about your hand, it's about your range. Look, I see this all the time. People will come up and they'll be obsessed with some obscure triple barrel bluff with 10-9 off that they have at 0.001% in their range. That's not important. What actually matters is your overall strategy. When you triple barrel, are you using appropriate value hand classes for how much money you're putting in? Are you roughly using the right amount of value and bluffs overall relative to the bet sizes. What he's talking about is being balanced. Um, you have to have a certain amount of value hands, a certain amount of bluffs, and this should not go out of proportion because if you value bet way too much and never bluff, your opponent can easily fold a lot of the time. And if you bluff way too much, your opponents can call you down to light. So that's what he's talking about. Have the right frequencies. For example, if you open 8-6 suited here, the actual frequency that you open this hand is irrelevant. What actually matters is how much you're opening overall. If you open too wide, people can exploit you by 3-betting more. If you open too tight, people can overfold and then your aces don't get paid enough. It's about the overall range construction rather than the minutia of each combination within your range. Tip number four, winning the pot more often does not equate to maximizing value. That, by the way, was a good example um, where you should devi deviate from strategy, from the general strategy, if you play against a bad player who doesn't give a shit about um, yeah, being balanced, who's not paying attention, who's also um, calling you down no matter what, when he has middle pair or something, then you should just try to maximize value and not... Uh, stick to um, your ranges or if it's a huge calling station you probably don't want to bluff even if gto dictates that i mean these guys even they, they don't recognize their image and that they should fold a lot because people are value towning them all the time and yeah that's important to know too this was i already talked about this before so yes our next point maximize v not how how often you win the pot Okay, that's that's right. Sometimes you want your opponent, if you want to give your opponent the chance to draw to something, and you don't necessarily want to protect at all costs and end the pot here because the other line might have a bigger EV or expected value. Okay, this is really common. The human mind tends to remember losses more strongly than wins, and this creates a very natural cognitive bias, tempting people to try and win the pot immediately instead of making the highest EV play. That's going to cause you to overplay medium hands because you're afraid of getting outdrawn. It's going to cause you to overfold in spot where you have big implied odds, spots where, you know, you're going to lose more often than not, but... I think, um, for me always, mentally, it was the biggest problem if I let someone draw to something where I probably could have ended the hand earlier and then I lost the hand because he hit. I was kind of upset, upset, but yeah, keep in mind that this happens so and so often and you shouldn't, uh, you should keep in mind that you would have won like 70% of the time and he only gets lucky 30% of the time. And yeah, it's all about the EV and long term, it doesn't matter that you lost this individual hand it's just the bigger picture you have to have the bigger picture in mind all the time you're missing out on that opportunity to win a massive pot let me give you an example yeah if you are in a hand don't think um how i get the most protection and how to end the hand here and win what is in the pot always think how 
do I get the most expected value from this situation? This sometimes it could be to just get maximum protection, but sometimes it could be that you slow play, for example, or yeah, or that you choose a different bet size than the one that you would choose if you just wanted to end the hand and protect yourself from yeah all sort of weak draws like gut shots example let's say we roll this dice one through six if it rolls one through five you give me ten dollars pretty bad bet right five out of six times you're going to lose however let's say when we roll a six i give you a hundred dollars now all of a sudden you're going to be losing often sure but your overall expected value is eight dollars and 33 cents per roll that's awesome that's a huge chunk of value in your favor despite the fact that you're losing so often you're going to win a huge pot once in a while because you're maximizing value instead of looking at how often you're going to win. And the same concept applies all the time in poker. Let's look at an example. So back to the... I mean, this is abstract way to say he's talking about you, but it's true. You have to think, have to think like this. This might be the case, which you lose often, but if... In the case you are winning, it makes up all the losses and you have to continue. Don't just quit this very profitable dice game he introduced. This Queen Jack 6 example. Let's say you've bet small on the turn, big blind calls, and its action is on you on the turn. Now, I think a lot of novices will see all the draws. That's also a great luxury. We don't, we will not have that many turn sims in PLO. If you want to study turn and post flop more, then I suggest that you don't sign for PLO Trainer, but for PLO Vision, as they have more post flop sims. But for pre flop, uh, PLO Trainer is better. And PLO Trainer also adds sims all the time. So, yeah, they might be able to catch up at some point, but at the moment, um, PLO. Uh, I mean, both product products are great, but yeah, you, for example, you could uh, suggest to um, subscribe to one for one month, and then change to the other one, and yeah, have learn from the from both things and see which one uh, matches your your style of learning best, and then get a longer subscription as you save a lot of money uh, once you sign up for a year that's what i did as well i also had both at some point i even have both simultaneously but yeah at the moment i just have PLO trainer but yeah that's just my personal preference and yeah everyone has different preferences and likes other things more or gives other yeah, maybe you are a genius pre-flop already and Need to now learn post flop only, and it also it, it also differs. Um, some have other bet sizes and more rake structure and all this stuff. And the Pilo Train also has the more accurate sims, they, but these take a lot longer to build, and that's why um, Vision has the edge. And I think it's probably also doesn't matter to have the super accurate sims, because yeah, even the smaller sims already give you a good idea of what to do but yeah i digress let's come back to the video talking a lot about plo while this is a no limit hold'em <laughs> video on this board you know there's going to be five four there's going to be ace ten and king ten and ten nine and a million different heart draws that's scary so what do most of them do well they start barreling a bunch of their second and third pair they start putting a bunch of medium hands into their betting range because they're terrified of getting outdrawn but the truth is you're not going to be folding out most of the hands that you want to fold anyway with a bet and the problem also is you value town yourself against a lot of better hands. <laughs> and if you bet large enough that you do start to fold out flush draws and straight draws, well, you've now completely overplayed your hand to the point where you won't be ahead by the river. So it's a null strategy. Instead, you need to accept the fact that your second pair is just going to get outdrawn sometimes, and that is the way it is. Similarly, let's say you decide to overbet on the button. Actions on you in the big blind. You have a hand like, for example, 5-4 suited here. Now, 5-4 
is way behind all of their value. And in fact, I'm going to switch this drop down to all. We can see that the equity of this hand is 29%. That means we're going to be losing this hand, you know, more than two thirds of the time. However, the expected value is positive because when we do hit our draw, we're going to stack villain for a bunch of money. You know, we hit a flush draw, we're going to stack all of their straight draws, their two pairs and their sets. Those implied odds make this a valuable call. Same story with a7 here. You know, this hand is behind. However, because of all the extra implied odds we win on the river from big hands when we hit, this is going to be a plus EV call. You shouldn't be folding this hand despite the fact that you only have ace high. So instead of thinking about how often you're going to win the pot, think about how much money you can win. Maximize your value. Rather yeah, there's also a very uh, important concept, which he doesn't call by name, but it's called implied odds. So how much more money can you um get from your opponent once you make your hand and if these implied odds are high you could call even if the immediate odds are not good enough to justify a call for example if you have to call a pot size bet with just whatever a flush draw you would normally need way better odds but yeah if you have great enough implied odds so get more money from your opponent on later streets you can justify a call and therefore, for example, you have to have enough stack left in both of your stacks. So the effective stack size has to be great enough in order to justify this. And your opponent needs to be willing to put more money in once the flush comes in. Other than how often you win the pot. Tip number five, stop overvaluing big cards. Most recreational players massively overvalue big cards. Any ace, anything with Broadway cards is, you know, just so strong. If they, for example, face a three bet and a four bet, they're not letting go of ace jack. It's ace jack. Why would you let go of this hand? Or for example, if you have queens and you bet flop, turn and river, and then you fix Yeah, ace jack sounds like a very bad hand to call four bets or get all in. I mean, even ace queen is probably close against many guys. Face a river check raise on a flush completing, straight completing, boat completing run out. You need to let that hand go. You've just got an overpair, right? A great hand preflop doesn't translate to a great hand post flop. I think a lot of this comes down to some form of entitlement tilt. You know, you deserve to win the pot because you had a good hand preflop, but that's just not how it works. And in fact, that kind of behavior. Yeah, even worse, if people have ace king, I think they often stick to their hand even if they miss the flop completely they are just completely tilted and are like what the fuck why i didn't hit an ace or king but i still uh, didn't fold and yeah that's huge mistake especially beginners and um recreational players make is going to kill the value of your premium hands because you're going to run into so many reverse implied odds especially playing cash games 100 big blinds deep that the ev you gain by betting them off the hand is completely dwarfed by the massive pots you lose when you can't fold these post flop so don't overplay big cards this leads me to my next point. Most of your EV comes from nutted hands, assuming you're not overplaying them post flop. For example, here we can see that most hands are extremely close to break evens. Yeah, that's especially true for Hot Limit Omaha, which is not the topic of this video, but yeah, you need way better hands and more and go more in the direction of the nuts. You this is yeah, as you have poor cards in hand, you make better hands way more often than in no limit holding. Zero, 0, 0.1, 0 0.2. Realistically, very few hands in your range make up the vast majority of your expected value. Yeah, you can see aces, kings, queens have insane amounts of EV. I mean, ace, king isn't even that great. Look at this. Queens do way better. If I see this correctly, even jacks are better than ace, king. That's why it is so important to learn how to play your nutted hands correctly and to optimize your strategy such that your nutted hands actually get paid off, right? If you're a complete nit, you probably aren't going to extract a whole lot of value when you do make a strong hand because, well, frankly, people are going to recognize that you're a nit. Similarly, if you overplay all of your weak hands, sure, you might get paid off when you have value, but it doesn't matter because you've already lost 50 pots spewing it off with queen two suited. I want to show you a graphic by a good friend of mine named Kevin. 
this is something he. Oh, Kevin. Seems like Kevin put in a lot of work. Uh, the we have more messages in chat. No, let's also remove my my ugly face for a moment, but we can see this probably posted on two plus two a couple years ago, and this shows the expected value of every hand in a button opening range. As we can see, hands like aces, queens, kings, ace kings, jacks, these premium hands make up the vast majority of your expected value. For reference, the size of the square is equal to your EV. The rest of these hands are icing on the cake. They're flavoring, they're designed to get the bigger hands paid off for the most part. Now, when it comes post-flop, this is no longer going to be the case. You know, different hands will become nutted hands. But overall, what actually matters is how you play these high EV nutted hands, because that is You're where most sick. of your EV comes from. Realistically, most of your value in poker comes from just coolering people. Just yeah, I think you also make the most money from aces in PLO. And in No Limit Hold'em, aces is like a very tiny part of your range only. But in PLO, it's 2.5%. And if you play PLO 5 cut, it's even uh, more. I think it's about 4% or something. By the way, if you want to learn um, PLO 5 card, there's also a solver out there for this game. And yeah, I also have linked it. So feel free to use my referral link so that I will also get a small... Um, Small amount. The for, for you, the price stays the same. I will just earn like twenty bucks or whatever. <laughs> I don't know what the exact amount is. You know, having the better hand and making them pay with a worse hand, and conversely, avoiding spots where you have the worse hand, like Ace Jack off, facing the better hand. So learning to play your nutted hands well is absolutely fundamental to improving your win rate as a poker player. Tip number seven, start by mastering your preflop strategy. Mastering preflop is the quickest and most efficient way to drastically improve your results. That's because every decision starts with preflop. Preflop is very important. It's especially in PLO, people are like, preflop is not that important. Equities of hands run close together anyways. But yeah, this is actually not true. So you, you still have to have decent fundamentals preflop and yeah, for example, it's very important to have nutted hands or hands that can make the nuts. Uh, ace high, ace high suit is way better than a king high suit because yeah, you you make the nuts if you hit, and if you have the king high flush, you always have to fear the ace high flush. So very easy, and yeah, if you are not fundamentally solid preflop, you probably will not be able to win in your game unless. Yeah, your opponent, you find very, very, very soft games. And this is not that easy anymore online. I think online it's probably impossible. Live, you might still be able to find some very fishy games. But yeah, preflop is, is like the fundamental of all of it. And it's also easy to learn, way way more easy to learn, learn than postflop. So yeah, definitely um, perfect this and... Do most decisions perfectly or close to perfectly before considering to yeah to to get in the game and it's also so easy to today to to study this and it, so yeah everyone who does not do this is just yeah not um, having the professional attitude to be a winner or to become a winner. If you make this part of your strategy automatic, not only do you set yourself up to play post-flop well, but it's one less thing to think about when you're actually playing poker at the table. You should definitely not make this automatic. This is like a huge, huge mistake I see even many regulars make, but yeah, this is complete bullshit. Um, against people who play close to the correct frequencies, obviously you should use the automatic thing that is in your head, which you learned. But if you play against someone who has like 90% VPIP and 40% free bet range, you obviously have to adjust to that and four bet him a lot lighter and free bet him to isolate against his weak range and push the other regulars out. So yeah, 
definitely do not do this automatic, but also just to your opponents. If someone is way too loose, you also can loosen up and stack off lighter, for example. So make this part of your game automatic. The best way to do that is to check out GTO Wizards new practice mode, which lets you practice from preflop all the way till river. By practicing this, by making this strategy just something that's automatic to your play, you're going to set yourself up, play well. On yeah, mm, the programs I was talking about, PLO Vision and the PLO Trainer also have uh, practice modes where you can study things and learn in quizzes. I also have videos where I show it. You could also, if you don't have the money to afford that, you could uh, go to this videos and learn what to do in certain preflop spots or postflop spots. Not sure what uh, videos I did, but yeah, there, there are a lot of that out there. On every street going forward. Tip number eight, and this one's a bit controversial. Most of your heuristics are based on lies. You see, almost every heuristic, rule of thumb, generality you come up with is inevitably going to be based on faulty assumptions. And that's because if you play through experience, your perception... Why should this be? I mean, yeah, okay. If you play based on experience, there could be some not fundamentally solid things in there, but if you make this heuristics based on GTO and math, this should not be flawed. So yeah, I disagree with this. Option of a winning play will be skewed by the meta in which you play. It's going to be skewed by factors such as risk aversion and bias and wanting to win the pot more often. To truly grow as a poker player, you need to let go of old habits and broaden your horizons. And this is especially true when you're first starting to work with solvers. You see, solvers are confusing. Okay, if you just first start to learn the things and don't know much yet, this is probably true. But if you are an experienced player or even an intermediate, you this is probably not necessarily true. And the vast majority of people have some worldview in mind, some overall strategic hierarchy that they believe this is the way poker ought to be. You just have to have a worldview that makes sense and that is correct. <laughs> then you don't run into this issue. Played and then they just confirmation bias their own results. They'll just look at the strategy and they'll only look for things that confirm their old worldview rather than trying to decipher why their worldview might be wrong in some spot. I mean, by the way, if you get to this point or got to this point, I also got a second channel. It's mostly about investing in cryptocurrency and money. And if you're also interested in that, you should definitely check this one out too. But yeah. After this shameless extra plot, let's just get back to the video. Bean. And this is true outside poker too, but more so in poker. You need to accept the fact that most of your heuristics, your generalities are based on lies and faulty assumptions because you cannot learn, you cannot grow as a poker player until you accept that the more you know, the more you know you don't know. Tip number nine. Very important. Um, many people... Uh, Two results orientated, that's what I would say. And also important, a lot of people are not able to learn from their mistakes. This is a trait which is most important, or not most important, maybe not maybe most, most important, but ex at least very important to become a professional or at least a good poker player. Okay. Variance is much, much bigger than the human mind can conceptualize. True. The That's so true. I mean, you get so fucked in poker all the time or in casino games. So yeah, can, even if you play perfectly, you can lose so much. So yeah, variance is huge. And I recommend that you play around with variance calculators on the web and you will see how bad you can run. And but the, another mistake would be many people always think if they lose that it is due to bad luck. Never make this a habit of yours. I mean, it could be the case, but often these people are just not honest with themselves, and the competition is just better, and they're spewing off money. They have to. They have either have to quit or to become better before they compete again in this game. So be honest to yourself and don't always um, say that it's 
all happening due to bad luck. It can be true, but it doesn't necessarily have to be true. So yeah, be careful with this assumption. Gambler's fallacy is very common among poker players. Let me give you an example. Let's say we flip a fair coin and it lands on heads six times in a row. What's the probability that it lands on heads on the seventh flip? Well, if you're a suspicious gambler or, you know, just like most recreational. It's 50-50. Bam, bam, bam. Poker players, you might think to yourself, wow, you know, six heads. We're pretty much O to tails, right? But no. That's not how it works. The next flip is still 50-50. You're just as likely to flip a seventh head as you were to flip heads the first time. And that must be the case because the coin is 50-50. So what's going on here? Well, you need to understand the law of large numbers. After thousands of flips, we expect heads and tails to even out. But that's not some universal godly karma. It's just the law of large numbers. Imagine we continue to flip a thousand times and heads retains that six point lead. At that point, we will have flipped 503 heads and 497 tails. This is actually the expected value when starting with a six point lead for heads. At that point, we flip 50.3% heads and 49.7% tails. That's much closer to 50-50 than we started with, despite the fact that tails never caught up. And if you keep increasing the sample size and you keep... I think he could have uh, found a better example for a huge variance. Um, I think it's pretty common to lose like 20 stacks nowadays. I mean, even like 40 or 50 buy-in downswings can probably happen, even if you are a good player and have good game selection. So yeah, that gives you a better idea about variance, I think, than what he's talking about. <laughs> Keep retaining that same lead well you're gonna come up with the same numbers it's gonna get closer and closer to 50 despite tails never catching up and that's just how it works out similarly we see the same thing in poker just because you know you've had some run bad doesn't mean the deck owes you anything right just because villains sucked out on you three times in a row doesn't mean they're less likely to suck out on you the next time the deck doesn't have memory um, let's give you an example. I have, this was probably in terms of uh, bad luck, the worst session of my life in terms of uh, stacks. I lost, I lost 50,000 against a dude on, uh, what was it? 510. So the buy-in is 1k. I lost 50 stacks against someone. I mean, if I have to guess, he probably was... It's minus 50 to minus 100 uh, big blinds per 100 hands. So that's how worse this dude was. But I kept on losing and losing and losing. And I, it was just insane. I mean, we also did things that even increased the variance. Because, yeah, he was like a huge gambler. He always was like, let's, let's do a preflop flip. And I also was like, okay... I want to do preflop flips because I want to be deep with this guy and then I can crush him harder. So some of this was also flips that I lost, but still. So I usually flipped with him a bit until I had at least 200 BB, sometimes even until 400 BB. Then I tried to get back the enormous stack he built and I at some point always failed. And it was like, I was always getting my money in. I, I mean, he had like... 33%, 20%, 25% with like 10k pots or 20k pots and I, he just always won. And in the end, after like two or three hours or however, how long, however long this session was, he just quit with 50k and I was so fucking tilted. I was like, what the fuck just happened? And I also looked in Holy Manager, the program that I said is very important, looked into the statistics, saw that how bad he is, also looked into the EV. I was whatever, making 10k in EV, but lost 50k to this guy, and yeah, this was very devastating. And yeah, next day, the, the guy came back, and everything was upside down. Um, he continued to play very, very bad, and I was able to win back a lot. I mean, not a lot, I think I won back like 20k, and then he just quit, so he still had 30k on paper of my money but yeah if we would have continued i'm pretty sure i would get everything back or even more i mean whatever he had in his account but because long term the how this dude was playing is 
just not sustainable and he cannot win against an, a good player with this style. So you need to understand that poker has a lot of variants. And in fact, there's a tool I recommend you play with to get your mind around this concept. This is a poker variance calculator. This yeah, that's what I was, um, was talking about before. So yeah, you can see first variance. Yeah, what's the win rate? Win rate is zero. I mean, if you have a win rate of zero, you probably should not play. But yeah, what how many hands? How many hands is this? One, two, three, four, five. So it's hundred k hands, and your EV is zero. So it's the win rate is. Uh, so we should be here, and yeah, you can do this bad or this good. Yeah, variance is huge, as he said. Um, there you could. I mean, I think the standard deviation is small. I think it's even bigger. And yeah, if you play PLO, standard deviation also is bigger than a no limit hold'em. So yeah, this probably has to be increased, and then the swings will become even greater. Ones by Prime Dope, but others exist. So let's imagine you're a solid cash game winner. Okay, you win five uh, big blinds per hundred. Very, yeah, five solid, very, very solid, very respectable. Nowadays. And standard deviation is 100. This is completely typical. This is to say how swingy your results are. You don't need to understand this exact number, but just know this is very normal for a 6 max. Yeah, the um, standard deviation also changes based on your playing style and uh, if you play heads up or ring game and how many players are on average on the table. Yeah, you can uh, get this number also in Hold'em Manager, by the way. <laughs> You could put in your exact number and don't have just to put in the random 100. Next cash game. Let's say you play, I don't know, a thousand hands. A thousand what are the chances that you come out ahead, that you win money after a thousand hands? Well, if we calculate, we can see the probability of a loss after a thousand hands is about 43%. So, you know, pretty high chance that you lose money. Okay, what about 10,000 hands? Surely it has to start converging after 10,000. Well, there's still a 30% chance that you lose money after 10,000 hands. Okay, what about 100,000 hands? That's a huge sample, right? That's more than some people play in a year. Well, there's still a 5% chance that despite being a very solid winner... Yeah, you also should never forget that if you are on a downswing, you probably cannot maintain your 5 PV win rate. It goes down because you are constantly on your B or even C game. And your win rate is probably higher if you are on an upswing and it's like 7 BB. And if you're on a downswing, it's just 2 BB. And in the end, the average is 5 BB. And putting in a ton of volume that you still lose. 5.69%. That's huge. That's like more than 1 in 20. So you need to realize that variance is way bigger than the human mind can conceptualize. We cannot in our mind... Yeah, and in, in uh, PLO, it's even worse than... No limit hold him. Minds wrap our heads around a hundred thousand hands, let alone conceive that a winning player would be losing after that many hands. Yet statistically, this is gonna happen once every 20 runs or something, right? This is completely possible. And the inverse is also true. You can run like an absolute god, right? You can, for example, at probably the best of this interval, you're gonna be winning a ton of money. Despite the fact that you might not be playing that way. People often ask, you know, is poker skill or is it gambling? And the truth is, it's both. You need to accept that this... In short term, luck is, <laughs> is king. In the long run, skill is king. Is a gambling game and it is a skill game. You can have an edge, the same as you could have an edge trading stocks in the stock market. And yeah, that's why poker is such a great game. Because... Everyone can compete against everyone, and even the worst player in the world can beat the best in the world in one session. But over the long run, long run, he will not be able to do this, but he could in a short session. So that's why poker is that appealing, and so many people want to play it because, yeah, the variance is huge, and everyone can beat everybody. But for example, if I what is a boxing world champion? I don't know. Let's say Floyd Mayweather. If I box against Floyd Mayweather, I win never. 
I have a 0.000% of stat chance of winning. Or if I played against a, a chess grandmaster, I also have a 0% of chance of winning. But if I play against the best poker player in the world, I got a decent chance of winning because I'm also good in the game and luck plays a huge role. Uh, you got a lot higher than in the other things mentioned before. But you're still gambling and you're still taking on risk and you can still lose despite playing a good strategy. Wrapping your head around this variance is fundamental to long-term success in poker because like it or not, every bad poker player is going to have an absolute horrific downswing if they play long enough. That is just guaranteed. The reverse is also true. They're going to run like a god at some point. You really need to look at both and you need to understand that this game has a ton of swings. Tip number 10. Final tip of the video, stop overplaying medium strength hands. Guys, this is... Yeah, all of a strange tip. It's really common. You need to develop a medium strength, showdown value, pot control, check back kind of range. Most weak aggressive players have two strategies. They've got the give up range and everything else gets the gas pedal. This type of player never wins at showdown with those. Yeah, you also need a pot control. <laughs> uh, yeah, gear, whatever. <laughs> those marginal hands because they either bet so aggressively that they fold out their opponent or they get to showdown against a narrow range that has them crushed. This is not a good way to organize your equity. A better way is to construct value and bluffs. That way you're polarizing using strong. So he's basically saying what was also being said in a uh, tip before. So you should have good balanced ranges and don't overplay. And that, un I mean, hands basically are put in buckets and you should not miss a bucket and you should also not put the wrong hands in the wrong bucket so the very aggressive bucket sh probably should not have middle pen there to bet all three streets for example this is should be in the bucket for pot control but try to get showdown yeah hands on weak hands and the opponent is guessing with every hand in between meanwhile your medium hands which are going to check more and realize their equity get to showdown against the range they can actually beat. If you want to learn more about this system, you can look up, for example, the post-flop game plan or the four categories of poker. Uh, I'm not going to go into it in this video because there's a ton of content about this already on the internet, but essentially you want more than give up and gas pedal. You also want medium that just wants to realize equity and go to showdown. All right, that's it for the video, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like this kind of content, please let me know. Like, subscribe, hit the bell. And of course, if you yeah, this video was good. I mean, I think on some points he was going too much in detail or doing too too much of yeah like talking, and he could have put this in the more compressed way. And some points could should have been one minute and in his video it were like three minutes not sure if it's just my impression because i know about most of these concepts already but yeah good video yeah we we might watch some more of his content later or in, in a another stream yeah i hope you enjoyed this and learned something and my commentary was also helpful although i'm not playing actively anymore if you enjoyed this video, like, subscribe, share all the good things. And if you consider to get one of the tools I mentioned in the description. Yeah. Bye until next time.